All right, let's start phonology. So phonology is about how sounds pattern together and how they're perceived by people. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out which sounds in languages are perceived differently or which sounds are important for meaning. Now, in other words, one way to think about this is how does your brain sort sounds? So for instance, if I say the word sip and zip, let's take a look at the transcriptions of sip and zip. They're exactly the same except for one segment. S and Z are different, but everything else is exactly the same. So this forms what we call a minimal pair. And what this tells us is because the meanings are different for these words, this means that the sound S and the sound Z are different in the language. In other words, they're perceived differently. They're important for meaning. So if I make a S sound in a word, you'll know it's different than a word with the Z sound. So if I take sip and go to zip, it's a different word. Similarly, if I take a word, let's say hiss, and then instead of saying hiss, I say his, then you'll know it's a different word because these are perceived as different sounds. But of course, this works with vowels too. So for instance, with hit and hoot, the only difference between these two are the vowels i and u. So because these two words form a minimal pair, we can say that i and u are different sounds in English. In other words, we perceive them differently. Now you might ask, well, what would be a case of sounds where they're different but we perceive them as the same? And don't you worry, we're going to talk about those. So this leads us into a discussion about something called complementary distribution. And this is when a sound has multiple variants that depend on the environments in which the sound occurs. Now, that might sound like a bunch of uh, jargon right now. It's not even jargon, but let's just take a look at this. So for instance, I have a word like end and ept. End, ept. Now, the thing about the first vowel in the word end and the word ept is that the vowels are pronounced differently. Now, this is your question about perceiving different sounds as the same thing. See, in English, in the word end, air goes through the nasal cavity, so it's a nasalized vowel. But in the word ept, air does not go through the nasal cavity, it is just an oral vowel. But we don't even hear a difference between these two sounds in English. We do not even perceive a difference. But these are two different sounds. So this e, eh, this nasalized e, eh, will occur before nasals, while the other e eh will occur in every other environment. So these are what we call complementary distribution. Similarly, in the word stand and stabbed, again, a eh in stand is nasal, but a eh in stabbed is oral. So once again, these are two different sounds, but because we're used to having nasalized vowels before nasals and oral vowels everywhere else, we just perceive them as the same. If we replace the a in stabbed with the a in stand, then we don't get a new word. If I say stabbed, you still know it's stabbed. So the sound isn't changing the meaning of the word. So the a and the a, the nasalized a and the oral a, are not two separate phonemes in English. They actually belong to the same phoneme. And this is what is called allophones. So we can think of phonemes, allophones, and then we can talk about the environment in which they occur. And this is really a nice way to wrap everything together. The way I like to think about it is the phoneme is what is heard and interpreted by your brain. So your brain classifies sounds into phonemes. So for instance, in my brain, I have this sound eh, and I have the sound a. Eh. And if eh occurs in most scenarios, and it's the oral eh, I will hear it as eh. But if I have an eh that's nasalized, occurring before nasals, I will still hear it and interpret it as a regular eh. But the sound is different. Similarly with eh. So if I have a, eh, I have the nasal one before vowels, I'll still hear it as a, eh, and I'll still classify it in my brain as a, eh, and the regular a eh is classified as well.
So we always consider the phoneme to be the most commonly used sound or the most commonly heard sound. So the nasalized versions only occur before nasals, while the regular oral versions occur everywhere else. So the regular version is much more common than the nasal versions of these vowels. And this is true for every single vowel in English. Every vowel in English has a regular vowel and a nasalized vowel that occurs before nasals. But we hear them as the same thing. So one really important thing that is normally introduced in phonetics, but I'm saving it for now, is English aspiration. And what this means is that in certain spots in words, voiceless stops like p, t, and k have a puff of air in them. So if I say a word like cup, cup, there's a puff of air in that k in the word cup. But if I say a word like bucket, bucket, you don't have that puff of air coming in your mouth. Or if you have a word like scotch, there's no puff of air coming out on that K. So English has two different Ks. There's actually more, but these are the two I want to focus on. And you've probably never realized this, that we have two different types of Ks. You hear them as the same because your brain just says, these are all just Ks. But your mouth produces a different K in a certain environment, and your ear hears it as that K in that given environment. So what is the rule for when we produce an aspirated K compared to when we produce an unaspirated K? Well, aspirated Ks occur at the beginning of stressed syllables. Now, you might say, what's a stressed syllable? Well, in one-syllable words, the syllable will always be stressed. In two-syllable words, it's usually the syllable that is the loudest or the longest, like bucket bucket. Well, b is going to be our stressed syllable, and ket would be our unstressed. Now, you might say, well, what about this k in scotch? Well, it's not occurring at the very beginning of the stressed syllable because we have this s in front of it. Therefore, we don't have this aspiration on our k. And of course, the regular k we could say will just occur everywhere else. So, we have two variations of k in English. But you probably never realized that, and it's pretty difficult to hear. But there is a difference between cup and bucket. This happens with T and P as well. So pot versus tap, or, I mean, you have the tap, the aspiration and tap too, so tap and bat. Uh, and then you have the pot, and let's say another word like uh, hop, hop. It's not hop, it's hop. Okay, so that's English aspirations. There's another example. Now, I just told you that aspiration is essentially an allophone of the unaspirated version. So meaning that we don't distinguish the meaning of aspirated K from an unaspirated K. We hear them as the same thing. But there's a language, Kamai, that does hear a difference. So if you say cut with the aspirated K in English, it would mean to polish. But if I don't put aspiration on the K and I just say cut, cut, then it means to cut. So in English, these would be the same word in English. These, we would hear them exactly the same. We would say these two mean the same thing. But in Kamai, no, if you have an aspirated K and an unaspirated K, they're different sounds. So in Kamai, these are two separate phonemes. You have the unaspirated K phoneme and you have the aspirated k phoneme. So we can see that these phonemes are language specific. So for instance, in English, our vowel nasalization, we hear them as the same thing, a nasalized vowel and an unnasalized vowel. But in other languages, they may be completely different sounds. So one thing, again, we talked about minimal pairs earlier. Let's take a look at this. These are minimal pairs. Look, they're the exact same transcription, except they differ in one sound, that k. So once again, that is a minimal pair, and this leads us to believe that these are two separate phonemes in Kamai. So very interesting. Here's one more example, and this is kind of an example of a phonology problem. If you want a more in-depth guide to phonology problems, I do have a phonology series on the channel about six videos in, and you'll be able to do all of the phonology problems. It's a little bit more advanced, but uh, it is a better in-depth explanation if that's what you're going for. So here's a problem. I have this L and I have this voiceless L, and I want to figure out 
where in English does a voiceless L occur and where does a voiced L occur? So I have these things called environment charts on the right. And basically what we do is we take a look at our target segments, so the L and the voiceless L in each word, and we write one thing to the left and one thing to the right. So for instance, in the first word slip, I have a regular voiced L. So I can put an S and then I can put a blank space for where my L occurs and then I can put I. So basically I'm saying the L occurs between S and I. In the word blight, it occurs after a B and before the I. Now the voiceless one, well the voiceless one occurs after a P and before I. And in clip, it occurs after a K and before an I. So I have to figure out, okay, which environment does the voiceless L occur in and which environment does the L occur in? Because there's no minimal pairs here, so it's going to be two allophones of the same phone. In other words, there's some situations where we have a voiceless L, some situations where we have a voiced L, and we hear them both as the same thing. So I look at these and I say, okay, between these two, whatever follows them, it doesn't seem to have any effect on the output. So it can't be the sound that comes after that's affecting it. Instead, it has to be the sound before it. So what's interesting about the sounds before it? Well, in L, you can have either an S or a B before it. What's similar between an S and a B? Nothing much. But what about this voiceless L? The voiceless L occurs after P and after K. Well, these are voiceless stops. So after voiceless stops, we get a voiceless L. So play, there's no voicing on that O in play. But in slip and blight, there is voicing on that L. So after voiceless stops, we have a voiceless L. Everywhere else, we just have the regular voiced L. So in order to kind of solve these data sets, there's four steps you want to do. You want to check for minimal pairs to see if they're separate phonemes. Then you want to make an environment chart if there are no minimal pairs. You want to make the hypothesis, just like we did about voiceless stops. And then you want to take a look at the data set to make sure there's no exceptions to your hypothesis. Again, if you want a more in-depth guide to this, check out my phonology series. It is in way more detail and is fitting of a second level course in phonology compared to this, which would be a first course in phonology. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them.